So good evening, everybody, and welcome to the first of NUI Galway's virtual information evenings for 2021. My name is Gavin Collins. I'm the Vice Dean for Student Recruitment at the NUI Galway College of Science and Engineering. So the theme of tonight's virtual information evening is science and engineering, and we'll try to present to you some of the information that uh, we think you'll find useful uh, about our science courses and our engineering degrees uh, over the next two hours. So the way we'll structure this evening is in hour one, uh, seven till 8 p.m., we'll talk mostly about science and uh, the 32 different ways we have for you to become a scientist. And I'm joined by some guests on my panel this evening, uh, and those include uh, Professor Jacqueline Keane, who's from the University of Hawaii. So she's from the university's Institute for Astronomy. Uh, I'm also joined by my colleague here at NUI Galway, Liz Coleman. And Dr. Coleman is uh, the leading uh, academic on our new climate physics uh, stream. And you'll hear a little bit more about that later on. And we've also got a current student uh, uh, who happens to be a recent graduate of microbiology, who will join us as well during this first hour. And then in the second hour, uh, I'll be joined uh, by another of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Colum O'Reardon. And uh, Colum is the director of our BSc in Computer Science and Information Technology. Uh, and we have a current student, Joanne, uh, who's in the final year of that degree, and she'll join us as well. So more about engineering and computer science in the second uh, hour from eight to nine. But for this hour, then, as I say, we'll focus firstly on, on science at NUI Galway. So the plan is that I'll uh, give you a brief overview for the next, say, almost 20 minutes, just to fill you in on the range of courses uh, we offer in science uh, at NUI Galway. And uh, then we'll hear a little from uh, Liz on climate physics and we'll go straight into our panel discussion and we'll welcome our um, uh, audience to send questions to us by chat. One other thing I'll mention is that throughout the evening, we're also joined by Oshin Cusack, uh, who's from sport at NUI Galway and Oshin will be happy to answer questions you might have uh, on uh, sports at the university. Uh, we're also joined, I think, by Kathleen Hartigan, and uh, Kathleen uh, is representing the NUI Galway Access Office. So she'll be able to answer questions uh, about uh, alternative routes to university and also uh, access to uh, underrepresented uh, prospective students, uh, people from uh, socioeconomically uh, uh, difficult um, situations, uh, including uh, also people uh, with disabilities, uh, and, uh, um, and Kathleen will be will be able to tell you about uh, the services available through the access office. So if you have some questions for Kathleen, you can also ask those on the chat. And finally, then, uh, if you have some general questions about admissions to the university, please also type those in because we have some other colleagues from the university who are also uh, ready and uh, happy to answer some of those. Okay, so I will then shift to uh, full screen to show you my slides. And as I say, I'll have about 20 past, so about 25 past, I think we'll, we'll move on uh, and hear from Liz and move to our panel discussion. So this is an overview on science at NUI Galway and really on uh, the 32 ways uh, you might become a scientist with us. And this refers to, well, the breadth of choice available to you across the sciences uh, at the university uh, and the range of different subject areas and pathways that are open to you. I'm conscious we have some uh, fifth year, sixth year students joining us this evening, and you may have already uh, browsed through cao.ie and seen the options available at NUI Galway. And you'll see that there are 13 different BSc degrees listed uh, on CAO. However, I'm here to tell you that 
uh, your choice is actually a good deal wider than that. And I'll explain how there are indeed 32 different ways uh, to study science with this. So I'll tell you a little bit about the university, why you might think about studying science, why science at NUI Galway, because you obviously have lots of different options, and then how to study science with us. And briefly, I'll focus on our newest uh, degree course, Agricultural Science, uh, and I'll finish off by giving you some tips on how you might find out some more information. So a little bit about the university first. Well, we're consistently ranked amongst uh, the top universities in the world in the top one or two percent, according to, for example, here you can see the QS world university rankings. So these are systems that rank the thousands of universities worldwide uh, and uh, NUI Galway consistency consistently sits in the top one or two percent. We also take sustainability really seriously, and, I, and I'm sure this will be of interest to many of our prospective science and indeed engineering students, especially now that we're bang in the middle of COP26 and uh, lots of people are talking about sustainability and climate action. So almost everything we do in the university now is actually influenced by our contributions to the Sustainable Development Goals uh, for 2030, so the, UN, uh, the UN's SDGs. Uh, and in fact, some of those ranking systems uh, specifically rank universities uh, on this basis. Uh, and NUI Galway does really well uh, in this respect, particularly uh, on the areas where we're really strong on research. Uh, so, say, in uh, energy and marine and environment uh, and uh, in data uh, and in many areas of healthcare as well. So, you're here tonight perhaps because you're thinking maybe you want to be a scientist. So, I would say it's good to think about who scientists are and where they work and what they do. And really, I would say scientists are required everywhere and careers in science are as varied as they are many. So, could take me all night and into tomorrow to list all the different uh, possible careers a scientist might embark upon. Because really, I would say what makes all of those people you see there, you know, the science communicator, the person working in energy and agriculture and meteorology, the astronomy uh, graduate, the marine biologist, the ecologist, the forensic scientist, what makes all of those people a scientist is their core skills. And I've listed what I think are the core skills of a scientist and what you would train in were you to uh, study science at university. So the first is in understanding big, you know, sometimes existential challenges and questions. Things like, say, climate action or indeed COVID-19 and maybe the next pandemics that, uh, that we might encounter. So understanding those and asking the right questions in an informed way, really, frankly, I guess, in only the way a scientist uh, could. And secondly, then, in trying to answer those questions, you'll need to apply analytical tools and generate information and data. And you'll train in understanding which will be the appropriate tools to use at every given turn to answer those questions. The third is analyzing those data and making sense of them. Uh, the fourth is drawing conclusions from the data and from your analysis to support decisions. And often scientists find themselves in a privileged position in society then where they can influence uh, decisions say by policymakers and politicians and the rest of society. And you need look no further, I guess, than the critical role that scientists have played during uh, the pandemic and uh, in helping to formulate our response to COVID-19. And lastly then, um, the fifth core skill that I would identify is effective communication. And scientists need to be able to communicate with each other about their science, but equally they really do need to be able to communicate effectively with non-scientists. And I would say that is increasingly the case uh, as science takes a more central role in our lives. And that's something we place a lot of emphasis on uh, as you study science here at the university. So why study science then and earn a, a Bachelor of Science degree or a BSc? Well, it's frankly to get those core skills. And our graduates then have employment prospects in lots of different industries in the pharmaceutical, biopharma, 
chemical petroleum, new energy uh, renewables sectors in medical devices and med tech and electronics, computers, financial services, IT. And really that's just a set of examples. They're also in education at all levels, in research, in public service, in the health service, in local authorities, in the EPA, and so on. And within six months of having graduated, 98% of our graduates find uh, relevant employment or relevant further study. So there really are excellent uh, employment prospects. So why then might NUI Galway be a good choice for your BSc degree? Because really, I would say all excellent universities, you know, up there in the top one or two percent, as I mentioned, will deliver on those key core skills in science. However, we think we do it exceptionally well, and we think the emphasis we place on the different aspects of your training means that you'll be in safe hands with this. So I've boiled it down to these five reasons why NUI Galway is a good choice for your BSc degree. The first is around some of our unique specialisms. So marine science, for example, is the only such degree in the country. You'll hear in a moment from my colleague Liz, who can tell you about climate physics, which we're really excited about. Um, the second is around careers, and I mentioned the excellent employment prospects. And uh, in the chart here, you can see that this is from the College of Science and Engineering, uh, and it's data from the Higher Education Authority that are undergrads. You can see in this orange column here that 54.8% of them within six months of having graduated are working full time. Another 35% or so are in full time further study and only 2% are looking for work. The third is around our most influential scientists. So some of my colleagues uh, are amongst the most highly cited in the world, meaning that their work uh, has been read and noticed by uh, many other scientists and that they're making a big dent uh, in their field. So you get a chance to sit in front of uh, those people in your lectures and their passion for their topic and their subject can bleed across uh, into your learning. And I think that's something we uh, we put a lot of importance on. The fourth is around placement and fieldwork and study abroad. And um, many of our programs, and I'll tell you about this a little later as well, uh, for engineering, but it's also the case for several of our science degrees, uh, that we have a formal placement uh, with an employer as part of your, uh, as part of your uh, degree uh, schedule. Uh, for fieldwork, Think about where we are. We're bang in the middle of having the Atlantic Ocean on one side and access to the Marine Institute and the national uh, research vessels. Uh, we have Connemara above us, the Burren beneath us and the River Shannon on the other side. So we literally are in a unique place on the planet. Uh, and for people working with environmental science and ecology and even say the fieldwork aspects of physics, which you might find surprising, uh, they uh, will find themselves essentially with access to all of those outdoor uh, laboratories. The next part of that uh, point is study abroad and uh, all of our students will have the chance to study abroad for a whole semester, a whole term. Um, if their grades are good enough and if they can impress us sufficiently well in an interview, uh, we'd have with you. Uh, so we'll have that interview in second year and you could perhaps study abroad then for a time uh, in third year and we'll map your results from uh, your time abroad back onto your, uh, your uh, marks and results in Galway. And lastly, then our teaching infrastructure. So all of our students will typically, as part of their science degree, undertake a research project in their final year. And they'll do that in our research labs with our professors and postdocs and uh, PhD students. So we don't hide away our best resources and equipment from you. Instead, we bring you in and we host you uh, as part of your learning. So you get to see our best equipped labs. Okay, so there are indeed 32 different ways to become a scientist uh, at NUI Galway. And uh, really what this means is that you can earn one of 32 different uh, BSc degrees with us. So let me try to break that down and explain what's on offer. So this is a relatively busy slide. This refers to the 20 different pathways on our main our flagship BSc degree, and that's GY301 on the CAO. And you'll see that there's a, a bunch of different yellow pathways related to maths and data science and computer science. The blue ones here in physics and climate physics, uh, medicinal chemistry and chemistry, earth and ocean sciences, and over on the pink line here then, 
anatomy, pharmacology and physiology, orange line, plant and agribiosciences and biochemistry, and lastly then zoology, microbiology and botany and plant science. So uh, you will be able then uh, on that degree to take four subjects, typically say biology, physics, chemistry and maths, for example, to get a foundation in the sciences in year one. But then in year two, take three pathways from those 20. So then in year three, you'll drop one of those, keeping two pathways. And then in year three, you'll have kept just one of those the whole way through to year four, and that will be your specialist degree. Now, many people refer to this as general science. I can assure you it really isn't. Um, I think general science would be a bad idea. Uh, you'd probably be really good at pub quizzes, but you might not be a really attractive graduate uh, for employers. So we never have, we don't, and we don't intend to offer a degree in general science. In fact, GY301, as you can see, is a specialist degree in science because you will specialize in one of those 20 pathways. So it'll be one of those 20, but now I've made the slide busier and I've added 12 other BSc degrees. So let me just take away those 20 pathways to make it easier to see those 12 other degrees. So there's two in maths, as you can see there. Uh, there is uh, physics uh, with options. There's biopharmaceutical chemistry, marine science, environmental science, earth and ocean science, environment and, environmental health and safety, biomedical science, uh, and then uh, biotechnology. And our two new degrees, agricultural science and genetics and genomics. So those you can apply for directly uh, through CAO. So some important messages then uh, to try to start to wrap things up. Firstly, each of our BSc courses, either GY301 or one of the other 12 I've just uh, put on the screen, they result in the same outcome, a Bachelor of Science degree. So whether you've earned a BSc in one of our pathways, say microbiology or medicinal chemistry or, mathem or, or mathematics, or from one of our uh, standalone degrees you can apply directly to like biotechnology, everything will be of the same depth and value and specialization. So every graduate leaves with the same core skills in science, but it then depends on which area you are most interested in and that you specialized in. So GY301 isn't general science uh, and GY301 graduates are specialists. And CAO points, Whilst they vary from year to year and between our courses, they don't indicate quality or employment prospects. They literally just are an indicator of supply and demand, the number of places we have and the number of applicants uh, we've, we've, we've received. So we've two ways then, our BSc degree, GY301, with 19 different pathways, plus our 20th one, which Liz will talk about, and then the 12 other standalone degrees. The pros and cons, well, GY301, there's a huge choice of pathway options uh, that uh, you can decide to take, but there are ceilings on the numbers of students that we can take into some pathways. And then the standalone degrees, well, the big pro is that there's certainty from day one, from the get-go as to where you're going and what you're going to specialize in. However, there is a little less choice along the way. Um, briefly, let me just put a, a couple of slides up on agricultural science before I finish, because it's our, it's our newest uh, uh, degree, which, which we launched uh, last year. So our first group of first years are with us this semester. So this is a unique program, GY322. It's jointly taught by ourselves in science and engineering and our colleagues in arts and social sciences. So it combines science with agricultural practice, rural development, and social science. And the idea is that we train the future leaders in the agricultural sector, which you know, undoubtedly is a, a really important sector into the future uh, in Ireland. So the sustainability of that sector and how it copes with climate action, but also how it um, uh, considers the sociological aspects of employment and rural development and so on will be a big focus. So it will take in all of those aspects, sustainability, agri-innovations, people, animal crops, bioeconomy, the technology and the sociology of this area. It's taught in the West, by which we mean in the West of Ireland, but also in, well, the global West or the global North. But it's got a global focus, including on international development. And some of the people leading uh, this course, uh, particularly um, my colleague, uh, Professor Charlie Spillan, who's the course director, has some really active links with 
uh, other universities uh, around the world, particularly in developing countries. So there's also going to be uh, a focus on that. So it will take in the SDGs as a kind of a guiding principle the whole way through this degree. So that's something uh, I would recommend anyone with uh, any curiosity about what I've just said there uh, might look up. So lastly, on finding out some more then, well, you can do lots of different things. You can uh, see our prospectus and we can even post it directly to you. We can send you a hard copy. Sometimes it's easier to use the hard copy than looking at everything online. You can see uh, our CAO hub at nuigalway.ie forward slash CAO. Uh, see our course web pages. So each one of our courses has its own web page. Compare courses, compare which are the modules you do from year to year because you know, that's, in my view, the only way that you'll easily be able to reckon whether you'd be happy in a course, see which modules and subjects you take from year to year. Because if you're uh, not going to enjoy a course, then you're very unlikely to do well or maybe even stick with it. Um, ask a question online. So you can ask a question online on one of the course web pages, and then maybe attend event, an event like Open Day or Taster Day, or congratulations, I see there's 150 of you here tonight at our uh, information evening. So that's a good first uh, step. Um, here are some shortcuts to each of those course web pages. So you can go nuigalway.ie forward slash gy301 for that degree and use just the CAO uh, course code to get a shortcut to any one of those. Um, we will have uh, a PDF of these slides available to you as well on our um, College of Science and Engineering webpage. So you'll be able to go to the PDF and click directly on those links as well. So we'll try to make it easy for you to, to get where you need to go. Um, lastly, then we have uh, brochures for each one of those. Uh, so in the PDF that we'll put on our webpage, uh, you'll be able to click directly on those and you'll see even more detail about the subjects from year to year on each one of those courses. There's several YouTube videos you can watch as well. So you can spend hours watching uh, interesting stuff about uh, science at, at the university. Lastly, there's uh, some information about equality, diversity and inclusion and uh, the Access Office. And as I said, uh, Kathleen from the Access Office is online to answer some questions you might have, but you'll be able to download from our PDF, uh, the Access Office um, uh, guide and here and there guides and so on. Uh, and there are scholarships and you'll get links on our website uh, around scholarship information as well. Okay, so to finish then, uh, I don't know what will be the hot jobs in 2025 or 2026 or beyond, but what I do know is that the core skills in science will be your calling card. Um, so it's a pretty safe bet that scientists will be in demand increasingly in the future and those core skills will stand you well. So I would say uh, come join us uh, and uh, we'll be really happy to see you at other events and perhaps to welcome you uh, next September to us. So I am going to uh, stop sharing and I think next I'm going to go to, um, to, Liz, uh, to Liz Coleman. So Liz, I think I might even get you to share your screen and you'll be able to share your slides and talk for a couple of minutes to our audience about climate physics. Is that okay? Yeah, no problem at all. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for coming along tonight. Um, I'll just share my screen. So I only have three. I have three slides and I'll just share them really, really quickly. But I'm very happy to ask any to answer any questions. Um, let me know when you can see this. Is that up on screen? Yes, I will, uh, Liz. Uh, it, it's on the way, I think, Liz, yeah, it's just taking a moment. Yes, it's there now, so off you go. Okay, um, so I work in, um, or I've been researching in the Centre for Climate and Air Pollution Studies, uh, which is within the School of Physics in NUIG, and we've been making measurements of the atmosphere um, back since, for decades and decades, since the 50s. And um, so when we measure, what we're measuring is how the atmosphere has been changing and we're and through this, through the studies that we do, we're able to tell how this affects our climate and how this affects our health and how this affects our environment. And uh, in the Center for Climate Change and Climate and Air Pollution Studies, we've produced some very high impact um, 
work that is directly fed into the IPCC report that that informs the COP26 uh, process that you I'm sure are hearing a lot about at the moment. So we're very excited to kind of to bring the, all this research into our degree programs in the physics and climate physics degree. And um, because physics is a degree that equips graduates with breakthrough potential for innovation and problem solving. It's a really, uh, it, through a physics degree, you gain the skills that make you highly employable across a range of, uh, a range of fields. But the, through the physics and climate physics pathway, this will now allow graduates to apply these skills that you get from a physics degree to meet the grand challenges facing our earth and climate system that we're so aware of um, in this in this current time and try and move on so um in the center for climate and air pollution studies and through this physics and climate physics degree um you'd have access to next generation state-of-the-art technology from modeling um modeling systems to instrumentation to understanding the processes that are causing climate change um, and air pollution and through to satellite technology and this uh, gives, this is a great offering for students because it offers students knowledge and context and experience for environmental solutions so that one could work in uh, the field of meteorology, in policy to influence how society might change to solve uh, the climate crisis, um, environmental protection, public awareness or forecasting or emergency response. So to be able to develop technology and services whereby people could respond to any kind of threats, that, environmental threats that occur. But of course, through doing this degree, you also get in-depth physics training that uh, will give you the skills for a degree, applying your physics to technology or even data, finance, education, engineering, uh, all the all the um, career options that are available to physicists. So um, if anyone has any questions about the degree, I'd, I'd be very happy to, to answer them. Uh, but otherwise, I think that's all I'm going to say. Great, thanks so much, uh, Liz. So uh, I might come back to you again uh, in a moment on, on climate physics, because uh, I, I think we may well have some questions and uh, I know I have some questions for you anyway, okay? Um, but uh, maybe I'll start our discussion now um, uh, with Jacqueline. Uh, do I see you there, Jacqueline? Yes, I'm online. I do. So um, for everybody's benefit, and I'll just ask Keen to put his camera on as well, let me um, reintroduce my panel then for the discussion. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll welcome you to keep asking questions in the chat and our other colleagues might be able to answer some of them. So even if you've questions say on scholarships or admissions, uh, our, um, our colleagues from the recruitment team uh, should be able to answer, I think some of those. Um, and I'll keep an eye on the chat as well. So if there's something relevant to our discussion, I'll be able to bring it in. And uh, uh, I'm sure Liz might be able to help me as well uh, to answer some of those. Um, so to reintroduce my panel then, um, Jacqueline Keane uh, is a professor at the University of Hawaii's Institute for Astronomy. Um, and she has kindly joined us uh, this evening. Uh, and Jacqueline uh, is a physics graduate of NUI Galway, I'm pretty sure. Isn't that correct? Yes, uh, that's correct. Yes, yes. Yeah, you can hear me. Yes, I am. Yeah, um, yeah. yes, I can. Um, and uh, Liz Coleman, who from whom we've just heard, and Liz is uh, the director of that uh, climate physics stream. Uh, and then Keen Lawless, who is a recent microbiology graduate uh, and is now a freshman PhD student uh, with us uh, at the university. So maybe to start with you first, Jacqueline, um, could you tell our audience, bearing in mind we have an audience of perhaps, you know, senior cycle leaving cert uh, students, but also perhaps some guidance counselors and uh, parents joining as well. Um, could you tell us maybe just uh, how you got into science and physics in the first instance? Yes. What, what drew you to it? Yeah, for me, it 
it really is quite simple. It's, I love looking at the night sky. I love looking at the stars. And uh, from a young age, I actually saved and got my own telescope. And I was fascinated by the space race, by, you know, the space station and all the launches. And I recall writing to the U.S. Air Force to understand how I could be a pilot for them. And they kindly wrote back and says, well, you should get a degree in science. And so all through my secondary school, that was in my mind. Um, so one thing I would like to say to anybody who's online here is um, I did not get my first choice in the CAO. And it's not a disaster. I have now got my PhD a number of years ago. I've worked at NASA and now I'm living in Hawaii. Um, so just what is important is, is to pick a subject or a, a select of subjects that is definitely going to interest you and keep you in university. So I did not decide to repeat my leaving cert. I took my second choice, which was actually, I think, in the GMIT, as it's called now. And I transferred from GM, GMIT to NUIG. And I got my honors in applied physics and electronic engineering from NUIG. And then I did my master's. So there are many avenues. Uh, don't give up. Um, and also, if you're worried about your mathematics, please just get, just pass your mathematics in the leaving cert. After that, you learn how to apply it through all of the sciences. You don't have to solve every problem. You just uh, will be thought how to apply it when you get to university. But do get your maths in the leaving cert. And if that means dropping to pass maths, don't be afraid to do that. Just make sure you get your maths. Sure, I think that's really sound advice. And um, in my experience, often I, I speak with prospective students who, who, who attempt to map out uh, their, their careers you know, uh, maybe six or 10 years uh, ahead um, and perhaps have very specific ideas as to what they want to do. But um, I, I hope that the, the story of, um, of, of my slides and also what you've started to tell us there, Jacqueline, is that, you know, um, it doesn't matter if things don't work out according to plan A or if you don't have, um, complete clarity on exactly what you want to do. And it's often okay to, to think that, well, um, I'm gonna take this first step and then see where that uh, lands me and take it one step at a time, right? Yes, definitely. And then keep in mind, it's nice to have in the second, the first, second and third year, especially the second and third year, an option to specialize and experience other fields and sciences. And for me, I was torn between chemistry and physics. And I'm, I'm very happy with the choice I made going down applied physics, because I got uh, a great depth of fundamental and physics, but also electronic engineering. And these are all things I use every day uh, in astronomy and astrophysics. I specialize in astronomy in my master's and my PhD. Mm -hmm. And could you tell us then maybe uh, about your, your job in Hawaii and uh, your links with NASA? Yeah, so my main role right now is as a research scientist. And what I do is I use all the telescopes around the world, but principally on Mauna Kea, which is one of our islands in Hawaii. It's at 4,000 meters and we have a whole slew of telescopes there. And my role, uh, we're trying to understand the building blocks of the solar system. Every molecule uh, has a fingerprint and we use infrared astronomy to uh, measure all those fingerprints for those molecules. And then we quantify, we measure how many of those species are there and they fold into models. We try and develop these huge computational models to understand how our solar system formed. So I spend a lot of my time uh, trying to quantify the gas and ice in comets. I was on the discovery team for the interstellar object that came from another solar system and whipped through our solar system called uh, I, one I, a Muamua, and I was on the, the, the team that discovered the second one of these. So we're finding things coming from other solar systems passing through ours. And it's just great to be on the forefront of things, newly discovered objects. And when I started astronomy, we only knew of planets in our own, own solar system. Now there's thousands and other solar systems out there. And the latest uh, space-based missions that I'm involved in will now start looking at the uh, possibility of life in other solar systems outside our own. And in, in my career to see that in 20 years, that's phenomenal. And that's just, every day it's great to see these new results. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I, I think we, we often hear that say, um, places like Nevada or the deserts are good places to have such telescopes, but presumably Hawaii is as well. Yes, yeah, so the best in the world is uh, Antarctica, and I've had friends go there. It's on my list. I haven't gone there. Uh, it's the dry, believe it or not, it's the driest place around. It's not actually deserts and you might think of. The second best in the world is Mauna Kea in Hawaii. We're high above all the wet clouds, and we have 
300, 325 days of the year where we have the best observing conditions in the world. And you get the better, the more stable the sky is, the, the clearer the sky is, the better your signal and more reliable your results after you analyze the signal. Excellent. Um, so it sounds like really exciting uh, kind of frontier type work then. Yes, uh, I, I love it. It's, it's challenging too, because you're, you're working with technology, which sometimes doesn't like to work. So you have to problem solve most nights and sometimes things don't cooperate, um, but it's wonderfully new stuff. And every year the instruments are more sensitive. So if you go back and look at the same object, you'll find uh, more molecules that are the weaker species that are key to plugging into your models to see how these things formed and then apply them to other galaxies and other solar systems. So it's, it's invigorating research. And I'm sure perhaps some in our audience might be thinking, well, yeah, that sounds really interesting, but why does it matter that, that we know this? I mean, that is a philosophical question. Um, some of the key things why it matters is we're trying to understand where water is in the solar system. It's not as simple as saying, yeah, Earth is wet. In fact, Earth is one of the driest bodies in the solar system. Um, Whereas the icy planets in the outer solar system is where all the water ice and things like that. So for the prospecting missions, which the space age has really taken off again, there was a lull in the 90s and 2000s for those of us, but now you have all the private industry driven by um, Amazon and um, uh, SpaceX. And it's, there's a new frontier out there that is now within our reach and can be done with private industry rather than government industry. Mm -hmm. um, so I moved to NASA right after my PhD to work on space mission stuff. And I was there for three and a half years in the Bay Area. And then I moved to Hawaii through a NASA program on astrobiology, which was looking for the signatures of life um, throughout the solar system. Mm -hmm. So it's just, you know, again, it's a, it's a philosophical question. But one of the things when you do physics is that you're working um, on technology that's applicable across many fields. And a key thing I would say is semiconductor physics, which is what I learned about in NUIG, um, is going to be uh, crucial in the next coming years for quantum computing. Anybody who's thinking about what's in the future, quantum computing heavily depends on superconducting uh, semiconductors and superconducting technology. Um, and you need to understand those fundamentals and you'll get those in a physics degree. And so it's, it, and I enjoyed very much with the NUIG physics, being exposed to nuclear energy, being exposed to medical imaging, being able to pick electives that allowed me to see where, how physics is used in the real day world. Um, so it's, it's, it, you don't narrow your field of vision when you specialize in physics, you can actually broaden it by taking these electives. Sure, indeed. And uh, it, it's, it's the case, of course, that uh, the physics degree um, has opportunities for students now to, to take streams in, in biomedical physics or uh, in uh, theoretical or uh, climate. And maybe there's one more I'm missing. Uh, I can't remember, Liz. Uh, biomedical applied uh, astrophysics. Astro, yes, yeah. of course, obviously. <laughs> I mean, it's the one we're effectively talking about. Um, I, I have one, one more question, though, Jacqueline. Um, and you. You mentioned that you're using the various instrumentation also to analyze the signatures that you see from those um, uh, chemicals. Um, so um, presumably there is actually some chemistry involved as well as physics along the way, right? Uh, uh, is that right? Uh, well, you're not detect well, yes, you detect the molecules and you're able to determine their abundance and you have to determine the temperature they're at, and then you use uh, your understanding of chemistry to infer how these molecules were created. So, you know, what reactions cause them. But what's important for us is that uh, we get to measure the relative ratios of these species. You know, we compare two species to each other and that tells you which chemical pathway dominated when that molecule was around. And then you can understand how that incorporated into the comet and what temperature the comet was formed at. So then you know where in the solar system it got formed because you go further away from the sun, it gets colder. So then you're able to analyze where that was formed in the solar system. So potentially this might even give some possible clues as to whether there's extraterrestrial life as well, or was or is. Oh yes, I mean, there is no doubt we'll find biosignatures, carbon signatures, because it's a standard footpath or, or that happens through all these processes. You start with hydrogen and helium and 
carbon and they all lead to complex more bigger species and um, you know whether you find another human i don't know but there's certainly signatures of of uh, carbon uh, molecules yes so pr pretty amazing that you could find all of that out whilst still standing on earth oh yes <laughs> in fact it's a it's a shame we don't get to go in spaceships <laughs> so, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Um, excellent um so Liz, you, you've presented some of the slides there on uh, the climate stream. Um, wh why have you launched the climate stream? Uh, uh, well, I guess, um, you know, it's such a major topic and it's only, begun, it's only going to become more and more um, important over the coming years. I guess a lot, of, uh, a lot of you people that are online are fully engaged with the climate crisis. And we, um, our science, like, we have re we have got this research center out in Connemara in, in a real in a very remote location on the edge of the Atlantic, and because of this because of the position of the research center, we're able to measure the cleanest air in uh, in Europe. It's it's like the baseline for air pollution in the northern hemisphere. So uh, by the grace because of this uh, unique and very uh, sophisticated measuring site we have we've really contributed to climate science over the last uh, number of decades. But we think it's a real, it's a perfect time to launch this degree because the climate crisis is on everyone's lips and minds at the moment. Um, yeah, so it's a great opportunity for studies that are in, for students that may be engaged, fully engaged with the climate, uh, with the, the climate to be able to gain a degree in physics and specialize in climate. For sure. And you know, I, I, I would say that many of our prospective students might be quite aware of uh, our environmental science and marine science and maybe even our earth and ocean science uh, degrees and uh, the relevance of those to understanding the environment, understanding uh, climate change and the science around uh, sustainability. But they might be less aware, I guess, of um, the uh, really important role that physics, as you've um, as you've outlined for us, uh, has in this area and in measuring um, the concentrations of, say, carbon and methane and air quality and the atmospheric physics. Uh, uh, that's 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 really strong at Galway and uh, particularly given our relationship with with Macehead. Um, so yeah, I think it's 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 incredibly important. Uh, uh, that um, you know, maybe our audience realizes this is part of uh, the the story and our approach to understanding. Um, I and guess, yeah, and to really, I guess, to come up with any solutions, we really need to understand the fundamental processes that are causing climate change. And uh, I, I, you know, what Jacqueline was just talking about there about like uh, curiosity be about the processes and like. Um, chemistry and physics coming together. A lot of that is true of uh, studying atmospheric physics also. Sure. And could you tell me then, well, tell our audience uh, um, what the difference might be, say, in choosing to study physics through GY301 or joining through that, as I said, standalone degree, GY320? Okay, so in you can, you can study, you can specialize in climate physics um, or applied physics through GY3, but through GY301. So these are the uh, undenominated science. And uh, in both of these, through both of these pathways, you get like course physics skills that you can then apply to anything. But in terms, if you specialize in climate physics, obviously you'll do it through the climate lens. However, if you choose to study GY320, um, you can also specialize in astrophysics, in biomedical physics, or in theoretical physics. Um, so there are five physics pathways available. Um, so if you want to study astrophysics or specialize in astrophysics, for example, uh, GY320 is the way to do it. Okay. Um, in okay. climate physics, you do some additional modules such as uh, sustainability, and megatrends that give you an overview of, um, I suppose, other factors besides the hard physics in terms of uh, environmental uh, solutions. Sure, sure. Um, I, I'm 
also scanning the questions we're getting in, and there's one from Carenza here, which uh, says that um, I'm a student uh, still in secondary school, struggling with choosing a course to study. Uh, do you know any useful resources for people who are having difficulty choosing which field of science or engineering to go into? Um, well, I, I think it's it's a very fair question. Um, uh, I, I would say that evenings like this evening will hopefully help, but equally, um, you, you might consider coming to our taster day uh, in the new year um, or our next open day, um, which I think will be in April, uh, though we'll be confirming that. Um, but equally, you can ask a question of um, any of our course directors um, uh, by going to the course web page and clicking on the ask button. Um, so that, 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 that should help, I think. Um, I, I, I would also compare the um, the course descriptions. So go to each of the web pages and have a look at the modules you do from year to year. Because as I said earlier, um, if you see a lot of modules that firstly might um, not be the type of modules you, you thought would be associated with, with, with that degree, and if you think you wouldn't enjoy doing them, well, then it's likely not the degree for you. If you find uh, that you see modules that do look interesting and you think you'd enjoy them, well, then maybe that's something you could keep on your long list for the moment. Um, because I really think that uh, if, if, if you're not happy and you don't enjoy studying a particular subject, you're unlikely to do really well. Um, I'm going to move along and bring Keen into the conversation. You can hear me all right, Keen? Yep, can you hear you perfectly. Yeah. So Keen, you studied microbiology, isn't that right? Yeah, I did. So could you tell us about your uh, experience? Uh, you were, I imagine, a GY301 student. So how did you make that decision? And then how did you end up specializing in microbiology? Um, so basically, when I came to college, I didn't know which science I wanted to do. So I knew that I really liked science, but I had no idea what I wanted. So um, I would say to anyone that isn't sure of what to do, I would definitely do general science. Um, so each year you get to specialize a little bit more, you know, you get to do what you're interested in. And by the time fourth year comes around, you've ended up with a subject that you're extremely interested in and you have it right there. Um, <clears throat> And, and Keith, um, which which other subjects did you take along the way? So in in third year, you had microbiology and another. Um, so I did biochemistry in third year, along okay. with microbiology. Um, the two of them paired very nicely together. Um, but in second year, I did chemistry along with microbiology and biochemistry. Okay, and and you think overall that was a good combination of subjects to get you to final year then? Um, I thought it was fantastic. Um, I thought that having a background in chemistry and biochemistry going into fourth year microbiology really helps you understand um, how to apply things and how to and how to just even understand different things that are going on in your course. And um, yeah, I think it, it is a really good idea to do general science. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's GY301. And did you take some other electives along the way? Um, no, I just took the straight up chemistry, microbiology and biochemistry. I see. Okay. Yeah. Very good. And could, could you tell us what uh, microbiology was like and what, what it's generally all about? Um, so generally microbiology is all about the microorganisms that inhabit the planet and the different ways they can, say, cause infections in the body, how they play a role in the environment, how we can then use them in the environment to clean up problems that we've caused. Um, but I, in, in fourth year, you get a really nice um, bit of every type of microbiology. And then let's say I branched into environmental after my degree, and I'm now doing a PhD with Gavin. Um, so that, that's another thing. I, anyone that thinks that doing general science, you know, may not be as specialized or may not cover as much. It, it does. It covers, I would say, even more than denominated courses because you can do what you're interested in. 
Um, and you can really pair different electives together to get a really full picture of what's going on. Sure. And uh, I imagine that throughout your experience, you've been in some uh, large classes with hundreds of students, but also in some smaller ones. Yeah. Um, so definitely as the years go on, you start get, getting involved in smaller classes, smaller little groups, which I think is is very good because you start as you learn more, you can start bouncing off other people in smaller groups. You can start learning off what they know. And I, I think it is a really good environment to, to enter. Mm -hmm. And you happened, I guess, to have your final year coinciding with COVID lockdown, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I did the entirety of my fourth year. How was that for you? Um, I was kept busy anyway, which was the main thing, um, which I think was probably the best just to, to have something to do, something to put your mind to um, for the entirety of that year. Mm -hmm. And uh, could you tell me a little bit then about other activities you might have gotten up to uh, in Galway uh, during, your, during your undergrad years? Were there any um, societies or, or um, other events that you... you um, I, I played hurling with the college for uh, two years and then I did kayaking um quite a lot as well which is which is honestly great um if anyone is coming to the college enter into as many societies as you can you get to know so many people um you make a lot of friends um which i think is is very nice um and just get involved i think it's a great thing mm -hmm. great um i just take a few more questions for the moment then uh, from the chat. So one person has asked whether it's possible to take some languages with uh, with science and with GY301. Um, uh, yes is the answer. Um, so there are various electives or optional modules that uh, you, you can take along the way, uh, depending on your combinations to, to make up your uh, required credits each year. Uh, so it will be possible, for example, uh, to take some uh, uh, modules through Irish. So there's a relatively limited number, but nonetheless, there are some that you can take through Irish. Um, there's also uh, French uh, and German, for example, that you can take as optional modules. Um, and uh, another questioner asks uh, whether, well, actually, just before I leave um, languages, uh, some of our other science degrees, say, for example, biotechnology, um, has built into its uh, schedule of modules um, French or German as well. Uh, so yes is the answer. You, you can uh, take some languages uh, if, if you really want to. Um, another question asks whether uh, GY301 is the only way to study zoology. Um, it's not, no, uh, to, to be fair. Um, it's the only way to earn a degree in zoology. Um, so following the zoology pathway uh, as one of the three you'd pick in second year and keeping it in third year and through to fourth year is the way to get a BSc in zoology. So yes, uh, that's GY301. However, um, several of the other degrees might allow you to take some zoology. So for example, um, if you take uh, the environmental science degree, so that is GY308, I think. Um, that uh, would allow you to take several zoology modules along the way. So you'd have plenty of options and some of them can be zoology. Equally, uh, the BSc in marine science um, offers uh, the chance to have quite a strong focus on zoology and on marine zoology. Uh, and uh, we have some really um, uh, uh, accomplished colleagues who uh, are doing some fascinating research on the sea floor and the deep oceans uh, on on marine zoology. Um, so I think uh, though, though, those those are also some really great ways to to, to get zoology um, under your belt as well. So uh, I hope that answers that question. Um, could you tell me, uh, Liz, uh, you've already ta taken the first group of uh, climate. Uh, physicists or it'll be next September I just can't remember 
Um, well, second year, there are some second years doing climate physics now. So they're currently uh, studying some core physics modules as well as looking at sustainability and kind of global megatrends. Mm -hmm. And there's obviously field work potentially built in along the way somewhere. Yeah, yeah. So uh, as part of the practical work during the degree, uh, we get to use the data and the instruments at, at Macehead in Karna which is the um, atmospheric mm -hmm. laboratory out in right. Connemara. Um, I, I, I could be wrong, but I'm getting the impression that possibly prospectus is um, is some kind of a bingo word in our chat. I think people are looking out for it, um, which sounds like a lot of fun. Um, could I maybe just lastly then turn back to, to Jacqueline? And um, I, I, I kind of wonder, like, um, is um there a gender imbalance do you think in physics and in astronomy so, so i got my degree in 96 so we can you know we can date each other that when i was doing my degree and i know there are one or two people asking questions about how many in the course and it changes with time when i was in my final fourth year in 96 i guess uh there were almost 20 of us and there were three girls out of that but i come from a family with three brothers so that that didn't bother me um but I will say the three girls uh, were were unique in that they did not go straight into Intel or AMD Athlon because you, we anybody who had a physics degree at that time walked straight into a wonderfully well paid job and still can I point that out to anybody who's online. Um, I went down the astronomy physics I took a, a European masters under I believe an Erasmus program and I got to go to Portugal and the Netherlands. And UIG offered me a PhD, also the University in Holland did, and I decided to take the one in Holland, and that started my career. The two others, one did uh, medical physics, and the other girl did, I believe, environmental science. Um, so we all had core physics degrees, but we all went separate ways. Um, so you can do anything, I believe, with a physics degree, uh, engineering, and you can even these days go into the biological fields, because you get a lot of programming, a lot of mathematical skills, uh, a lot of skills needed for what's that big buzzword now, which is big data. And so you learn how to um, assess, interpret, and analyze, uh, and use tools uh, and problem solve. Excellent. Thanks so much, uh, Jacqueline. Um, so I'm I'm going to answer one uh, last question before we wrap things up for science. And let me just say that I I, I hope that um, uh, we've, although we've concentrated tonight on on physics, that uh, we've still uh, at least given you the impression and. Um, uh, gotten across to you that there's there's a huge diversity of, of, of topics that you can study in science. But the, the last question I see here is um, whether there are any areas of science that could lead into veterinary medicine or science. Um, I, I think this is a very typical question we, 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 we get. We sometimes get uh, the question as to whether there's some areas of science that uh, can lead into, um, into medicine, uh, into nutrition, into dietetics, uh, into forensic science and so on and so on. And I would suggest that, um, yes, it is certainly possible to you know, earn your primary degree in an area of science that will be uh, relevant then for subsequent postgrad work. So it's possible to say, do uh, graduate medicine. It's possible to do a, a master's, you know, to get training in dietetics or nutrition or uh, in forensic science, if you say had chemistry or something relevant. So, so it, it certainly is the case, yes, um, that um, taking your example, the questioner in the chat, that were you say to have uh, quite a bit of zoology, um, that this might then place you uh, in a good uh, starting position then for further graduate study. Okay, so um, we might get to some more of those questions uh, later on, and we'll, uh, I think, have copied them anyway, so we'll, we'll be aware of what was asked. So with that, I'm going to make the transition then over to the next hour, and I'd like to thank uh, my guests, uh, Jacqueline Keane. Uh, so thanks so much, Jacqueline, for taking time out of your time back in Ireland, because I think you're, you're, you're back in the country now. Yes, I'm just home for the week. Yeah, okay, so thank you. So it's, 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 it's been very generous uh, of you to, to, to give some of your evening to us, and I'm very grateful. Um, and also to Liz, thanks very much, Liz. I'll be in touch. And uh, Keen, I'll see you in the lab. Thanks, Kevin. <laughs> okay, so th thanks all three. And I will share my screen again then. And uh, I'll ask uh, 
Cullum, uh, my colleague Cullum O'Reardon. Uh, Dr. Reardon is the um, is the uh, course director for uh, the uh, degree in computer science, and also Joanne uh, to put your cameras on. And what I am going to do is to share my screen again, and uh, I will uh, start the next hour. Okay, so. We're just coming up to eight o'clock then, and uh, with thanks to Jacqueline, Liz, and Keen, I'm going to then move into the next part of my presentation, which is focused on engineering and computer science. So let me just preface this by saying that uh, at NUI Galway, uh, the scientists and engineers have come together now in uh, one college under one virtual roof. Um, and a quotation we like to use is that scientists discover the world that exists and engineers create the world that never was. So scientists, scientists explore and discover and engineers create. And we've come together to innovate. Uh, and that's, that's essentially what we're trying to do by cooperating together uh, in science and engineering. And I think, you know, you've just heard uh, from the science hour, and I think you'll see lots of similarities in terms of the skills and how we speak about the subjects in this next hour, uh, when we talk about uh, informatics and computer science and software, and also all the different areas of engineering. So I am indeed focusing on engineering and computer science. And I'll tell you again, if in case you've just joined for this, um, for this hour, I'll very, very briefly, briefly tell you a little bit about the university, even less than I told you about it in the last hour, because the whole thing will be recorded. But I'll then move on to ask the question, why engineering and um, what engineering at NUI Galway is all about and how you can study engineering with us. Uh, something about our work placements uh, and the career prospects in engineering. I'll show you a couple of pictures of uh, our engineering home, the Alice Perry building at NUI Galway. Uh, and I'll, I'll then give, give a brief summary on computer science, but I do have my colleague Colm here who will be able to answer some more questions then uh, afterwards. And I'll give some closing thoughts on all of that. So a little bit about the university. I mentioned in the last hour, we're among the top universities globally, and uh, you'll be able to look back on the recording, but it refers to our place uh, in uh, the world university rankings. Um, we also take sustainability very seriously, and that matters for the last hour for science, but uh, absolutely also for engineering. Uh, you know, one of the major focus of our engineering indeed is on energy engineering and developing the technologies we'll need for this century to deliver on the uh, energy supplies and indeed the security of energy supplies uh, that, that's, uh, that, that will be required, including to tackle climate uh, change. So we've been teaching and learning engineering for a long time, for over 172 years now. So there's a, there's a long experience and uh, a deep heritage uh, at the university. Uh, the university first was Queen's College Galway, it later was University College Galway, it's now NUI Galway. But in 1906, Alice Perry became the first woman in the UK or Ireland to graduate with an engineering degree, and it was at uh, uh, then Queen's College Galway. So for that reason, our engineering building is the Alice Perry uh, engineering building. And if you choose to study engineering with us, uh, you'll be able to uh, have most of your classes and your labs uh, and your learning, uh, and you'll be able to hang out as well in the uh, Alice Perry building. So uniquely, uh, we've been able to bring all of our students under, literally under one roof uh, to study engineering. Okay, so I'll come back to the building uh, again uh, later in these slides, but I'll ask now, well, why engineering? Uh, so, you know, if you want to be an engineer, uh, what might be your contribution to society? So you want to be an engineer, who are they anyway, and what do they do? Well, engineers enhance the world we live in. 
They use math, science, design, analytical skills. They're builders, they're innovators, they're inventors, they're problem solvers. They work indoors and outdoors. They work in small and big teams, often multidisciplinary teams, maybe along with scientists uh, and maybe even along with say legal and business and arts people as well. So increasingly, you know, the workplace is becoming multidisciplinary. But engineers work on land, at sea, in space. So essentially they, they, they do literally work everywhere. They also use all sorts of materials, including novel materials. And I guess ultimately they, they make and they, they design and make things that society needs. So there's several um, different types of engineers and they're required everywhere in delivering uh, those services and products and solutions uh, that uh, the world needs as we face new challenges. And some of those challenges are depicted in these two examples here. We firstly got an aging global population. So you can see here in the blue numbers, this is the proportion of populations in uh, these areas that are currently over 60. But in red, you see uh, the proportion uh, uh, that will be 60 or over um, by 2050. So in many of the regions of the world, uh, that number will be much higher by 2050. So we have, uh, in general, um, uh, an aging population. People are living longer and with that comes lots of different challenges. And engineers sometimes have really surprising roles uh, in, uh, in meeting those challenges uh, from um, mobility to health to other types of well-being to how we learn and communicate and are entertained and so on. Equally then, the other um, big example of a challenge, uh, I would say, is oil dependency and energy and how we tackle climate change. Um, so you can see um, the areas in the world where uh, energy consumption uh, per capita is uh, really high. And uh, in many of the areas uh, uh, around uh, the world in North America, parts of Europe and Australia and so on, uh, there is a huge dependency on oil. And how we shift away from that uh, will require both scientists and engineers to develop the technology uh, and to make sure that it's sustainable and reliable. Okay, so engineering at NUI Galway then, uh, what do we offer? Well, there's several branches of engineering uh, that you might choose to study. The first of those here is civil engineering. And I guess I would kind of wrap civil and environmental engineering together. Um, and here engineers design the things that society needs, including say tunnels and bridges and buildings, and roads and wind turbines and other renewable energy technologies. Uh, and uh, in the middle there, you see a picture of a wastewater treatment plant that happens to be uh, Mutton Island at Galway City. Um, so increasingly, uh, we will need civil engineers to, uh, to build uh, that new infrastructure uh, to develop the sustainable economies and the circular bioeconomies uh, that we all know that we need. Um, electrical and electronic and uh, electronic and computer engineers then uh, will make the software and the hardware we need in the increasingly, um, I guess, kind of internet influenced and technology and informatics influenced worlds uh, that that we occupy. So, you know, everything from driverless cars to uh, the phone in your pocket, which essentially is, you know, a computer and it's uh, your shopping basket and it's everything that the internet can allow you to do. But it's also the internet of things that, you know, you can use an app on your phone to tell your Hoover to clean the house um, or that every time you sit on a plane that it's essentially a big flying computer. So how we... Um, cope with the uh, changing ways that we live our lives to develop that software and the hardware, including how we integrate with electrical grids and so on, and computer chips and semiconductors uh, uh, is the job of uh, those engineers. Mechanical engineering then is concerned with uh, moving parts of engines and machines and other instruments, uh, including uh, how uh, liquids move and hydrodynamics. Um, 
So everything from robots to cars, to the blades on turbines, to engines, uh, to even the, the devices that might be used uh, in medicine, uh, say uh, artificial hips and joints and pins and so on that, uh, that uh, might end up in your body at some point. And a little brother or sister of mechanical engineering is biomedical engineering. And this uh, will equally then include some of those med tech uh, devices and medical implants, uh, heart valves, and stents, skin grafts, uh, studying how bones are laid down and how uh, we might be able to engineer solutions to broken bones and to um, uh, problems uh, with bone health. And then energy systems engineering, or just energy engineering relates to the big challenge of how we develop novel technologies to get us past the climate and energy crisis that uh, we, we know about now. So how we develop solar and wind, geothermal, hydropower, hydrogen power, biomass and biofuels, um, and how we move past um, uh, fossil fuels, even including um, tidal and wave uh, energy. All of those uh, uh, challenges and opportunities will need uh, a new generation of energy engineers who will be able to support and push on uh, that new economy. So there are obviously huge opportunities that will have massive demands for new people and uh, new ways of thinking. Uh, because there's so much opportunity for innovation in this area. Okay, so how would you go about studying engineering with us then? Well, you know, you could be an engineer uh, if you enjoy maths, uh, science, technical subjects in general. Uh, if you're interested in new technology, in phones and in infrastructure and in how things work in computers and buildings and energy and medical devices. So ask yourself, you know, do, do you want to be a new technology user, you know, when the next phone or whatever gadget comes out? Or do you actually want to understand how it works? And maybe do you want to make the next one? Um, so, you know, answering those sorts of questions uh, will help you maybe uh, identify yourself potentially as um, a possible engineer. So you could indeed be an engineer if you have a H5 in two subjects, H7 or, or O6 in, in four, including a lab uh, science subject, uh, and H4 in uh, Leaving Cert maths, or um, uh, you pass a special maths exam that we have. So we uh, stage uh, a special maths exam uh, after the Leaving Cert, usually in August each year, um, and that can be another way to, to meet the maths requirements. Um, we get a question sometimes, you know, do I have to be really good at maths? The answer is no, uh, you don't. Um, maths is going to be important along the way at key points uh, for engineers, but no, you, you don't have to be a maths genius at all, um, in the same way as you don't have to be uh, to be a scientist, and in the same way as you don't have to uh, have all of chemistry, physics, and biology to be a scientist, you also don't have to be um, uh, really super good at maths uh, to, be, to be a good engineer. So you'll learn by doing. Uh, you'll learn by sitting in lectures, by uh, being in workshops and labs, uh, and doing group work and project work with your classmates, uh, field work, uh, and even exciting things like here there's uh, pictures of the mechanical engineering students who've been working with the GEEK car. That's the Galway Energy Efficiency car, and they've uh, won lots of prizes and races at international events that um, uh, that um, have really put the geek on the map. So um, each new generation of uh, MechEng students get involved uh, in developing that a little bit more. So to study engineering then, uh, you will come into first year either on the undenominated engineering degree GY401, or you can uh, come to us directly on one of the other uh, engineering programs on biomedical, mechanical, electrical, electronic, or electronic and computer, um, or civil or energy. So um, either way is fine. Uh, many students like the uh, choice that uh, is available by coming through the undenominated degree, and then subsequently uh, from second year onwards, joining one of, the, um, one of those uh, other branches that you can see here. 
um, you don't have a different uh, experience uh, in first year. So the first year engineering experience uh, is practically similar uh, across all of these options. Um, it's just that you leave your options open or you go directly uh, uh, into one of those branches. So you shouldn't worry uh, about whether you may not uh, get into one of uh, those different uh, uh, degrees in second year. Um, so uh, it is possible to come to first year and then subsequently make your choice. You will then stay with us for either four years for a bachelor's of engineering um, or uh, for a full five years. Uh, and after that point, you'll earn a master's of engineering. So we offer an integrated bachelor's and master's of engineering. And if you're staying for uh, four years only, then you'll take your work placement between uh, years three and four. If you're staying for five years, you'll do your work placement later. Um, equally, then we have one additional uh, degree, and that is project construction and management. Uh, and uh, that happens to be a BSc, but uh, everything you learn really is um, related to engineering. But that's a separate degree that you can apply for. So if you're interested in project and construction management, uh, take a look at that. OK, so there's a few really attractive elements, then, I would say, uh, about studying engineering with us. And one of those is work placements and what that means for your uh, future career prospects. So uh, all of our engineering students get uh, to do a paid work placement. Um, and uh, they'll undertake that work placement uh, with an employer. Um, and we'll also uh, give you during this time the chance to develop other career skills. You'll have one-to-one -one CV reviews, you'll have interview skills, training. So the idea is to get you career uh, prepared uh, and to get you as, as ready as possible. So during this time, you'll also develop your communication skills, teamwork, ethics, and professional skills. And all of those are provided to prepare you for the working environment. So here are just some examples uh, of the employers that uh, uh, work with us on uh, the engineering placements. Dell, Aerogen, and Intel, CISC, and others. Um, so there's um, a pretty wide uh, diversity because you, know, you see Merit Medical here as well. Um, so there's, there's, there's a diversity of employers who are involved in, in the process. And as I'd said in the previous hour, we'll uh, provide a PDF version of this uh, set of slides on our College of Science and Engineering website. So in that PDF, You'll be able to download it if you like, and uh, you'll be able to click on some of those videos. So you can watch videos of our students and see what they say about their experience uh, on uh, their uh, paid placements. Uh, so there is a student from biomedical engineering, mechanical engineering, uh, electronic and computer, and from civil engineering. You can hear from there. Um, Women in engineering is something that uh, we're really very focused on as well. And I had asked uh, Jacqueline in the last hour about uh, gender imbalances potentially in physics. And, you know, some subjects get uh, a bad reputation for having a poor gender balance. And these are for historical reasons and um, uh, preconceptions about uh, what subjects are all about and who they're for. But you know, I'm glad to say that we've been making really good progress um, in balancing um, uh, the, the gender uh, balance in engineering at NUI Galway over the last few years. Um, we're, we're now kind of creeping up toward 30 percent uh, of our students uh, being female in engineering. So we're really happy that we're moving in the right direction. And engineering really, as I said earlier, is focused on problem solving. And it isn't only uh, the male half of the global population that's going to face all of these challenges. Everyone will. So it wouldn't be a good idea if we only had male engineers. So I would suggest really strongly that, of course, um, uh, engineering is for everybody. Um, it's for boys and girls, for women and men. And uh, you can hear from some of our uh, really successful female engineers 
um, including watching these videos uh, on women in engineering from Engineers Ireland, from one of our MechEng students about the geek that I mentioned earlier, uh, and one of my colleagues, uh, Emer Dolan, uh, who recorded uh, a video here for International Women in Engineering Day. Um, so, you know, I think uh, if you are possibly interested in engineering, if you think you are curious about uh, the topics I mentioned earlier on, for sure, uh, talk to us at an open day or ask a question later on, and we'll 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 try to point you in the right direction. You can see where our engineering graduates end up working. Uh, so there's just a selection of graduates here, and they're in all sorts of uh, companies, uh, including civil, mechanical, uh, biomedical engineering, and electronic engineering. So just as there is a diversity of programs, there's also a clear diversity of employers and careers as well. OK, so briefly, I can show you uh, our engineering home, the Alice Perry building I mentioned earlier. Uh, it's the largest school of engineering in the country. It's uh, one big dedicated building, which has all of the uh, offices for uh, the lecturers and the technicians and the administrative staff. All of the students uh, learn there, go to lectures, attend workshops, do their labs, and all the research and engineering is done there as well. And there's a place to have coffee and to eat. So it really is uh, a really kind of um, uh, hub uh, that you can call your own and uh, consider your home on campus as an engineering student. It's unique in many ways in that uh, it's really a living building and it's essentially um, a living laboratory. You can watch a video all about the building here, but you'll notice if you find yourself walking through the building that you'll be able to see the, the concrete and the steel and all the ducting and the wires and so on that go into uh, making uh, the bits and pieces of the building. So as an engineering student, that's something that you'll be able to uh, revel in as well. So lastly, then, as we transition to the next portion of the evening, which will be um, a discussion with, uh, with uh, Colm and Joanne on computer science, let me just um, introduce you a little uh, to computer science at NUI Galway. Um, so again, you'll be able to, if you take the PDF uh, of these slides from our web afterwards, you'll be able to click on uh, this video from my colleague, uh, Professor Michael Madden. So uh, Mike is the head of the School of Computer Science at NUI Galway. So you'll be able to uh, go through and listen to his slides that uh, explore computer science at NUI Galway. But in general terms, um, this is a degree that's about computers and computing systems and our relationship with them. Uh, you'll have um, theoretical learning uh, and you learn about algorithms and data structures the whole way through to practical work where you get a chance to develop software and implement uh, the algorithms and uh, um, and um, actually see uh, your your work put to use. Um, it also includes artificial intelligence and you know I guess this certainly does speak to the um, increasingly deep role that uh, computer science has in our day-to-day -day lives. Uh, so from AI to human computer interaction, from programming language through to networks and uh, visual and graphic uh, processing. So you'll, um, uh, you'll learn about computer science and software engineering. You'll get a strong and broad base of uh, computing skills. It's a four-year honors degree. There's work placement in there. Um, there is a hands-on project and teamwork. There is also an optional extra maths stream. Um, and uh, it's a highly respected professional degree. In fact, it's one of only two professionally accredited software engineering degrees in the country, the other one being in TCD. So you'll have lots of problem-based learning uh, on this degree. It's GY350. And perhaps uh, in a few minutes, we can come back to this slide and uh, Colm can help, help us talk to uh, talk through it a little more. But in terms of careers, there's a, there's a huge uh, variety because, again, if you think of the challenges that relate to this area, clearly there will be a big variety of career opportunities as well. Um, software developer uh, has consistently for a while been ranked uh, in 
some of the, the top, the best jobs uh, in various surveys and analysis. So this one from uh, this website that you can click on here as well, uh, the 100 best jobs of 2020, number one was software developer. Um, and then uh, whether it's for you, well, just as with engineering, uh, if you think that you might be kind of switched on with problem solving, creating new things, uh, applying logic and so on, then uh, for sure, uh, GY 350 uh, may well be uh, the degree for you. Um, there are other ways to study uh, computer science. Um, and uh, I might ask you about that in a moment as well, uh, Colm. Um, so not just on GY 350, but our art students, I think, can get a flavor of this. And it is possible to do some uh, uh, computer science through GY 301 as well. Um, so to just uh, offer some closing thoughts before we go into uh, the next, the last phase of this evening uh, to chat with uh, Colm and uh, Joanne. Um, if you want to be an engineer then, uh, equally, just as I said earlier on, you can do your research by uh, getting a version of our prospectus. Uh, we can post it to you, as I said earlier on. You can go to our CAO hub and you can see the web address there on number two. Uh, uh, look at our course web pages. So just as with science, each of the engineering degrees has its own course web page, as too does the GY 350 degree. So there you can compare courses and again see which would be the subjects you can do year by year. So it's possible even to click on a module uh, and see who teaches on that, what the uh, main uh, objectives or learning outcomes will be, and really get a feeling for uh, the nuts and bolts of what you would uh, experience. Uh, and I strongly recommend that you try to spend some time doing that and then uh, start uh, knocking things off your long list and keeping some things on so that you can change a long list of courses into, into your short list. And then maybe come to uh, an open day or a taster day once you have your short list and really uh, get a chance to ask some detailed questions and we'll be happy to, to answer them. So I previously gave a list of all of the shortcuts to uh, our science degree uh, web pages, but here equally you can just type in nuigalway.ie forward slash gy. This time all the engineering degrees are for something something. So 401 is undenominated and you can see the whole way down through 256, 8, 10, 13, 14 are all of those others. Um, but computer science and information technology is GY 350. So that's the one I had just been uh, speaking about a few moments ago. Okay, so uh, just as with the list of videos I gave earlier for science, uh, you equally uh, here can get um, a long list of uh, videos uh, that can uh, tell you more about engineering, including about uh, some of the exciting research that we're doing uh, and the work placements and so on. So I think I will stop there uh, on engineering and I'm going to now introduce you to Dr. Colm O'Riordan, who's the director of GY 350 uh, Computer Science and Joanne uh, Chiguna, I hope I got that right, uh, Joanne, uh, who is a student on the GY 350 degree. So if I could maybe start with yourself, Colm. Um, sure. Thanks for joining me. Um, so who is the GY 350 degree for then, could you tell us? Okay, um, that's a good question. It's a, it's a hard one to answer to. Um, you mentioned problem solving earlier. And again, I'd echo that. I think for people who have an interest in solving problems, not necessarily classical kind of mathematical problems. In computer science, we deal with some abstract problems, which are mathematical, but also a lot of applied problems where oftentimes we're interested in making our computing knowledge and applying it to other domains, which involves trying to study or understand other domains and then apply the techniques we have in computing to those domains. So even with our final year projects, we have students applying computer science techniques and data analysis techniques in sports, music, health, um, um, monitoring people's behavior online to identify 
certain changes in behavior. So I think any student in secondary school who likes problem solving um, and possibly likes tackling problems across a broad range of domains um, would be suitable for computer science. Um, sure. Their mathematical content, and I think people who enjoy mathematics tend to enjoy computer science. However, we have a, a strong cohort every year who excel at computer science but would also advocate that they don't really like mathematics. And I think part of it is possibly the depth and breadth of mathematics that is taught in secondary school. Some of that becomes extremely useful in your computer science degree. Other parts you won't use as much. And I get the impression that people who think they don't like mathematics actually do enjoy large sections of it and enjoy the application of that. Um, so I think anybody who enjoys problem solving and if you have a mathematical slant, that's, that's probably a bonus. Sure, okay. So you don't have to be a genius at maths, but it would help if you, if, if, if you enjoyed at least some of the relevant- I think, I think so. We, we find students who enjoy mathematics tend to enjoy computer science, some of the logic and some of the problem solving. However, we often find students coming in who didn't enjoy mathematics, but after a year or two, computer science have a slightly different perspective on mathematics and how much they enjoy it or, or, or not. Um, and also, our, I should say, our maths requirements are slightly less than the requirements for the other engineering degrees you mentioned. Um, we take students who have, a, I think, an O2 in ordinary mathematics as well. Um, we used to have a standard that was equivalent to the other engineering degrees but we changed it and found that it had really no impact on the quality of the students coming in nor the, the level that the students kind of um, obtained. Mm. So could, could you tell me what would say a new computer science student expect to do then? Um, will they spend most of their time in lectures uh, or in computer labs or what else? Okay well it's a combination. We, we have lectures where you cover through the, the, the main concepts, but uh, there is a very strong practical aspect to the degree. So every subject is backed up with labs. Some of those are supervised labs, others are more kind of self, self managed where you're given assignments to do. And we also from second year on also have several group projects where the size of the project being developed would probably be too much for one person, so we try and teach the kind of benefits of teamwork and group work while giving the students larger tasks to, to do. Um, first year is very much an introductory year. We make the assumption that students haven't programmed before. Um, now that's beginning to change and that we have more and more students coming in with a background in computing, but traditionally the majority of our students had no previous experience. So in first year, we teach the fundamentals of programming, algorithms, and also fundamentals of physics, um, some mathematics, some electronics. Um, second and third year, then we kind of, there's a lot of work on programming, software development, a lot of stuff on database theory, networks, and really all the kind of core modules we would have the students up to speed in the first three years. There's then a big eight month placement in a company, um, typically local Galway companies, but often at the one Cork, Galway and a few, or Dublin and a few abroad. Um, and fourth year then we tend to deliver a range of specialisms where the students have probably more options to choose from subjects like um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, information retrieval, um, graphics and image processing, security and forensics. And also a sizable final year project where the students allow are allowed to choose or propose their own project where they can kind of tailor their final year to what interests them the most. So if they have an interest in HCI and hate networking, then they choose a project in HCI and spend more time um, exploring the areas they like. Sorry, what is HCI? Oh, sorry, uh, uh, human computer interaction. Okay. So this is how we interact with the machine in terms of interface design. Um, and a lot of that is inspired by work in, in kind of psychology. Again, the problem domain it involves a certain kind of mathematical aspect, um, but also a lot on kind of human behavior and behavioral issues as well. And it's becoming a larger 
in a larger area, given that commuting is becoming more, more prevalent in, in everyday life. Sure, yeah. And I, I want to come back to that maybe in, in a few minutes, you know, the, the, um, the creep of uh, technology into almost every aspect of our lives and uh, what that means for careers as well then. Um, but I'm just going to hop over to uh, Joanne uh, just for a moment. So, hi, Joanne. Hi. How are you doing? Pretty good. Good. So yeah. you you are one of the uh, students in the final year uh, class, isn't that right? Yeah. Okay. The final um, year computer science. Exactly. Um, so how how many people are in the class? So I'd say right now we're about sixty. Okay. You we were more more or less 70 or 80 in first year but you know you get dropouts yeah. for people who don't really so that's uh want to continue yeah that's quite a decent uh, size yeah. yeah um and could you tell us what you've enjoyed most uh so far about about the degree i'd say the best part was the the placement so for us we got seven months in a company and it was paid as well. So you're getting experience and also you don't have to worry about getting another job while you're doing it. It was really nice to meet people who are currently working in the field. You know, they give you loads of advice. You get to see how uh, the tech, the languages of programming that you learn is applied in, in the actual, you know, real companies, which is really, it was really eye opening. I think at that point, you decide on kind of what you want to do. For example, if you want to do more front end, like Holm was talking about HCI UI design, that you can get experience in doing that in the company. And they're usually very accommodating in uh, providing you with the experience that you want, which is really nice. Mm -hmm. And could you tell us a little bit about uh, what your uh, placement involved? Okay, so I was working at Genesis. Um, it's it's a US-based company, but they have offices in Galway as well. So I was in the predictive engagement AI department, so artificial intelligence department. So basically what Genesis does is they're a cloud, a cloud solution for call centers. So basically you, if you have a problem and you call, let's say Ticketmaster and you want a refund or something. So Genesis gives the software that provides the agent that pick up that picks up your call and then they can accurately help you. So it's basically a predictive learning software that adapts to behaviors that you do online and it gives you the results you want. So it, it takes away the time also that you'd spend looking for something that doesn't apply to you. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. so just another example of an innovation, I guess, then, yeah. Um, and were, were you the only person from the class uh, at that company? No, there were about five of us. It was a pretty good number. Okay, so, um, yeah. so you, 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 you got to work with them as well, did you? Well, no, not in my team, but we did have events that we got to see each other. Uh, there... There's loads of different departments. There was a machine um, learning department. There was AI as well. There was a DevOps. Um, it was a couple of different. It, it was a good variety. We were all spread out just so that we could get different experiences as well. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I'd say that once you get that experience, it's really easy to go back to them after you finish your final year. So for example, I'm still working for Genesis currently and I'll, after I do my exams and everything, I can continue to work with them after as well. So that's okay. a really nice path that you have. Once you get that internship, you're basically set. Sure, because I, I was going to ask, uh, you know, do you think you'd be able to get a good reference from them? But perhaps you won't need it if, uh, if, if you can indeed stay with them, right? Yeah, definitely. Okay. That's a really big... Uh, selling point for this course actually because the placement is what many companies look at they look at your experience you know what have you done to apply all the skills that you've been learning in class and it also gives you a chance to develop your social skills like 
it, even though it's like a course completely focused on programming, you also need to learn how to talk to your teammates and make presentations and all that. And that's a really good way to learn how to do that. Sure, yeah, it's, it's, it's a different context than uh, every day at university, right? Yeah, uh, definitely. Yeah. And, you know, certainly from what I hear, uh, you know, our students on, say, the science degrees like biotechnology and biopharmaceutical chemistry or environmental health and safety that uh, uh, offer work placements, and from all of the engineering students that uh, have their paid work placements, um, there, there are similar stories for sure that uh, this is a this is an eye-opening time uh, where you really get to see uh, how the things that you've been learning about are actually <laughs> done in the real world and in companies. But um, I, I've, I've also often heard that it, it's a really great opportunity to, to develop a, a relationship with an employer and, and to at least get a good reference. But um, I think it's fascinating to hear your story, Joanne, that... Uh, um, uh, it can then be possible to actually secure um, a longer term relationship with the employer as well. Yeah, actually on that, usually they offer you a position before you start your final year. So immediate, even before your contract for your internship ends, they usually offer, well, some companies, not all, obviously, but they usually do try and keep you on because they've already put so much time and effort into you. They don't want to let you go into another company. Sure. Yeah, for sure. Um, just so that we uh, paint a picture generally about student life and uh, especially about uh, your degree, could you tell us um, what were most of your, say, assessments or uh, exams like? Were they... Were they assignments that you turned in yourself or were they normally sit down exams or a mixture of both or project work? Um, what, what was the general breakdown? Yeah, so usually it's 40% uh, maybe for continuous assessment and you have about 60 for exams. So you have a pretty good balance, you know, you can build up your grade to the point where if you don't do so well in exams, you still get a passing mark or first class honors even. So um, yeah, it's a good mixture. Um, last year, since COVID happened, we it was online exams. And then in one module, we did a three-day project instead of an exam. So that was a change, but it was really interesting to do that as well. Sure. And there are different ways of learning as well as different ways of assessing aren't there and yeah <laughs> different ways of learning with two different people and um like often the way you learn at university will be different uh, to the way you'll have learned at school right yeah i'd i'd say that <laughs> it's yeah. it's a completely different environment i mm -hmm. mean you're leaving home to come well especially me i'm an international student so i left home and i came here alone so it is character building and the skills that you learn every day, you're going to apply it in your job and everything, which is, I think, a really good aspect of your learning experience that you need to develop. Sure, absolutely. Um, could I come back to you, Colm, then? Um, and uh, perhaps, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm reasonably aware that you and your colleagues do a lot of teaching around the university. So... Um, what are the various ways that students might be able to study computer science, if not through GY 350? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good question. I, I think it's a source of confusion sometimes for, for secondary school students as to which of the various options. So the degree we, we've been talking about, the computer science and IT, is probably the kind of heaviest or the kind of purest in terms of computer science. Um, you can also do computing and electronic, which you mentioned earlier, which comes through the engineering, which is, if you like, some of the software aspects from the computer science degree, but with a much heavier weighting on hardware and the electronic kind of underpinnings behind it. One can also study information technology through the humanities, through as, a, as an arts degree. And the advantages of that is if you're not 
sure or if you're interested in more than one subject. So let's say you're interested in IT, but you also have a passion for languages or economics or psychology, you can come in and do a, a joint degree. Uh, <coughs> you choose three subjects in first year and then two subjects in second and third year. And what this allows is students to come out with a rather unique combination of subjects. So we've had students come through with maybe a language and computing, and then they're very equipped to work in areas like computational linguistics. Or we would have students come through who would study economics and computing, and then they could go in and look at notions of kind of computer modeling, et cetera. Um, computing and psychology, again, it opens up areas in usability, et cetera. And we find a lot of our students who come through the humanities often stay on for an extra year and do one of our masters in software development or masters in artificial intelligence or masters in data science to bump up on a certain area within computing, having had a kind of a more general undergrad degree. Um, and we get quite a few, I think Joanne mentioned about 60 students graduating in our GY 350, we would typically have 30 to 40 students graduating through the humanities with a IT and another subject. The one other stream or the one other way that springs to mind is that one can also do through science. Um, you talked about the pathways earlier. There are two pathways which are computer oriented. One is in computer studies, where one would take some of the subjects on GY350, but would complement it with quite a few other modules in mathematics, statistics, and physics. And it would be more of a mathematics degree than a computing degree, but you would have a fair um, exposure to computer science material. Um, the data science pathway is similar with more of an emphasis on statistics. And I think there all the options. There is one in commerce as well, um, which is termed business information systems, which is more of a business degree, but it definitely has programming and databases. And the people who do that degree would typically work in the kind of financial sector or the business sector where their knowledge of computing would be useful. They typically wouldn't go into development opportunities or programming opportunities. Sure. But nonetheless, if uh, someone wants to be a uh um a computer scientist uh the, perhaps the safest bet is to at least consider uh gy350 and gy350 350. yeah and you mentioned earlier gavin as well the undenominated stream in engineering one can also transfer from that into gy350 as well that's yeah. been available for the last few years we typically get a handful of students who come into the undenominated and choose to specialize then in computer science Yes, and I'm glad you said that, Colin, because we had a question about that in the chat as well. Um, and um, in fact, uh, I guess what I would also ask is, uh, you know, I, I often get prospective students who ask me, you know, if, if they were to study science, you know, will they have to have a job where they always wear a lab coat for the next uh, several decades? And my answer is no, because science careers can be anywhere. They can be at the bottom of the ocean or they can be in a TV studio or they can be anywhere. Um, so I guess I have a similar question for computer science. I mean, uh, if you become a computer scientist, does it mean, does it mean you have to say, sit in front of a, a, a monitor for the rest of your life or what, like, how diverse are the jobs really? Yeah, it's, it's extremely diverse and I think Nowadays, it's even more diverse than it was 10, 15 years ago. Um, like we will have a large section of the class will possibly go into traditional development jobs, you know, where there'll be programming for a large software house like um, SAP or Cisco. Or you'll have a few will go into networks and telecommunications. We work with the likes of Ericsson's, et cetera. Um, there are an awful lot of smaller companies, um, and small ranging from a handful of people up to you know, tens of two hundreds um, who are hiring and doing a really ex exciting work in um, like the company Joanne mentioned, Genesis, who are doing a re really interesting work in artificial intelligence, natural language processing and machine learning. Um, but we have students who would have graduated with degrees who now work in 
you know, I have two ex students who work in three actually, sorry, third one joined in analyzing sports data for elite athletes. And their thing is to data mine the outcome of NBA basketball matches to make suggestions about training and positioning of players. These all had an interest in sport, but they never really studied sport per se. And what they're using is kind of pattern recognition and applying it to sports. And we have students in every sector. Computing has kind of permeated nearly every domain. So the financial sector has huge computing support. Um, health service has a huge computing support. Uh, all of the machines being developed in those domains all require a large kind of computational expertise. So our students end up in a, a range of domains. And I'm always kind of surprised when I bump into a student, you know, five, six years after the degree, and they've usually had, you know, two to three exciting jobs since and have moved, you know, quite sometimes quite far away from what they had started doing. Um, and the story Joanne had there about companies offering positions after placement is, is becoming more and more um, typical. The companies now compete uh, to try and get in early to recruit uh, students. We've had companies looking to take one quarter of our class at times with the hope of, uh, with the idea of offering them all a job after it. Uh, they are in demand. At the moment, our students, a wide variety of jobs, and we have typically 100% employment. Um, the only students who don't choose to take a job immediately in computing are those who go back for further study or decide to do something else. Uh, they might choose to go teach in computing, for example. Um, they're still in the domain, but not actively um, progressing it as a developer, per se. But the diversity is, is huge. It's, um, I counted up there the companies that took students last year on placement, and I think it was 35 different companies around Ireland taking our 60 something students. Um, and that includes the big multinationals who, you know, like to take 10 a piece. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's great. At all. Um, so this is really reassuring, isn't it? And um, it also sounds like maybe you're a little bit jealous, Colin, at some of the careers that uh, your graduates and uh, it's, it's, it's nice to see that they have all of these opportunities. Um, but some of the areas that are now available um, as jobs in industry were things when I was graduating, the only option to work in those was further research in the area. So a lot of areas in artificial intelligence, my own area, there weren't really many jobs in that when I was graduating. It was still considered kind of um, futuristic and um, unrealistic, whereas now there are so many domains where it's... Um, pivotal and outperforming human performance in, in a lot of demands. And it raises a you know, wonderful set of questions on, can we improve? How can we control ethics, et cetera? Um, yeah, so uh, uh, jealous to a degree, but uh, I'm quite happy to have all of these opportunities as well. You know? Indeed, indeed. Um, I, I might just touch on a couple of questions that have been in the chat. Um, I see my colleagues have been answering most of them, so thanks very much. Um, there was one that came separately to me, uh, and that was, does NUI Galway have any connections to car manufacturers for future possible jobs as a qualified mechanical engineer? Um, the answer there is yes. Um, I can't remember the name of the company, but um, there is a really strong link between engineering and um, some EV car manufacturers now. Um, if I... I, I'll look up the name of the company and put it into the chat before I before I close off the evening. Um, others have asked uh, variations of this question, and that is, um, will I get my first choice in engineering in second year? So if, for example, you uh, enter through undenominated engineering, uh, will you then say get biomedical engineering if that's what you want? Um, so uh, the answer is yes. So um, you can... Uh, with confidence come through uh, under uh, undenominated engineering um, and then subsequently choose the pathway that you want. Um, uh, another perhaps unusual question was um, for biomedical engineering, would it be a problem if I'm afraid of blood? Uh, I don't think so. Um, I, I think most, if not absolutely all of what you'll do uh, will uh, at least uh, not require you to interact with blood. Um, 
Okay, so I think to to wrap things up then, um, I might just um, ask yourself, uh, Colin, um, how did you get drawn to computer science? Yeah, um, partially by accident. Now, my, my main, when I was in secondary school, I, I was unsure as to what to do. And um, mathematics was the subject I always kind of liked. I was drawn to mathematics. But looking at university courses, I was always drawn to, I was also drawn to psychology, strangely. And I, I thought I might study that. But then studying the brochures, and I, I studied in UCC, if you studied mathematics, you could do it with um, another subject. And I chose computer science as my other subject because I was interested in kind of psychology and also the, the notion of artificial intelligence. So I thought I combined to do, but mathematics was my main kind of passion. But after I think about 18 months, I, I kind of realized my um, the aspects of mathematics that I most liked were the aspects that we were really studying in computer science. And that a lot of the areas in mathematics that we were doing in the maths degree, while I liked, were not as exciting as what I was doing in um, computer science. And then I, I, I swapped from doing a kind of a joint honours maths computer science to doing pure computer science. Um, and again, during the degree, like Joanne mentioned about placement, I worked for various companies and one research group in the university. And I, yeah, I, I think by the time I'd finished the degree, I was kind of um, far more obsessed with computer science and the kind of theoretical aspects of computer science than I was pure mathematics, but I definitely didn't set out to become a computer scientist per se. Um, I, you mentioned this earlier, I, I, I think some of the other speakers too, I didn't really have a, a plan. Um, I had a passion or an interest in something and I, I went with it. I, um, and even ending up teaching or lecturing wasn't part of my plan either. I, I liked the research, I set on to do a master's, then I set on to do a PhD and started doing some teaching and I just kind of fell into it and it gives me access to lots of nice problems um, and you know I think the interest I had back then I still have which, sure. is, which is good. I, I, I think this fairly much brings us full circle to uh, Jacqueline's comment earlier that um, you know it, it, it is possible to end up in an area that you perhaps didn't intend or imagine in the first place and I think that really is a um, something that uh, might be quite valuable advice. Um, I have since just uh, looked up the name of the company um, for the person who asked whether we had connections between engineering and car companies. And uh, the company is uh, uh, Valio and they work with autonomous uh, vehicles and they're actually a, a County Galway based uh, company. Okay, so with that, I think uh, we'll bring the evening to a close. Um, unless any of my colleagues in the chat wanted me to mention anything else, uh, I'll just keep an eye on the chat. You can tell me uh, if that's the case. And if not, uh, we'll, we'll wrap things up. So uh, thanks again, uh, Colin. Uh, and You're welcome. Uh, thank you. Um, it was very nice to have you. And uh, I think that was a really interesting conversation about computer science. So to all of our visitors, I hope that you found uh, the evening, if you were with us from the beginning, uh, interesting and informative. Um, and we will have other events coming up uh, during the year. So please uh, keep an eye out for uh, Taster Day and our next undergraduate open day. And news of all of those will be on social media, but you can also uh, keep an eye on nuigalway.ie forward slash CAO, uh, because we'll most likely have links there. Um, you can follow at uh, STEM NUI Galway. So look us up on Instagram or on Twitter as well. Uh, so we'll be getting more active on those and uh, posting uh, lots of information about our different courses. And uh, we might see you at a further event. In the meantime, um, have a nice evening and uh, good luck with everything else you do. Bye for now. Bye folks. Thank you.